What's up, Real Deals Podcast listeners? Hey, before we get into this week's show, quick announcement for you. We are opening up the next round of our REI Deal Generator two-on-one coaching program with myself and Justin Silverio. So if you've been interested in that program at all, this is the last time we're opening it up for this year, and you don't want to miss out. Last round, we had a couple fellas named Buck and James, a couple of great guys. They just popped 80 grand on a wholesale flip from one of the deals that they got from the machine that we built out for them, and they've got multiple other deals in the pipeline. So make sure you go to REI dealgenerator.com book a call we'd love to have you as our next students in the program welcome everybody to the real deals podcast one of the top real estate investing podcasts on itunes for the last seven years this is the place to be for investing strategies you can actually use expert interviews, and of course, some good old-fashioned entertainment. Now, here's your new hosts, Elliot Smith and Cole Rudd Johnson. What's going on, guys? Elliot here, Real Deals Podcast. We've got a great show today. Um, It's actually a show that I did with uh, Jonathan Farber, um, uh, Millionaire Millennial Real Estate Podcast. And so we kind of switched it up a little bit when we were doing this. And kind of just had a conversation kind of being a fly on the wall um you know we talked about some new wholesaling how you're going to get newer wholesalers what they're doing for business right now you know um what i would go do if i need to go get deals right at this moment and then also you know some higher level stuff on rehabs and what we're doing you know for our rehabs and how we're ran, 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 running our rehab projects so it uh, should be a really really interesting episode diving in he's getting started he's got like 98 podcast interviews so far episodes out there but he's kind of just getting started he's three deals in he's actually going to jump over and use our call center so uh yeah it's been uh, it was a good show so i think you guys are going to like it but a little bit about us uh me and what's going on locked up another deal last week um you are closing on it today uh tomorrow actually and then i'm locked up a deal today so business is going good starting to pick up a little bit we'll see how this election rolls out but other than that uh things are going good we're getting leads call magic's doing really good we got some people running our beta texting done for you texting service and that's going really good uh we'll be able to offer that out to the masses here at some point maybe just that's going to be more select few who's doing it but then uh people are killing it with cold calling just talked to one of our clients he's got nine contracts in the last two weeks um you know they're starting to get those leads that we've talked about where you got to work them incubate them build them up a little bit you know take some time and they've been using us for about a month and a half month and a half and they've got a couple of deals but now they're just starting to the deals are just starting to roll in so yeah everything's really going good so anyway hope you guys enjoy the podcast episode today it's jonathan Faber. um he's kind of more interviewing me but uh we ask him some questions dive into some good topics and i think you guys are going to get a lot out of this episode All right. Have a great day. All right, Real Deals Podcast listeners, I want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor, Iron Bridge Lending. If you guys have not reached out to Iron Bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects, I highly encourage you to do so. I've known the owner of Iron Bridge for a very long time. I've personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects, and I can say without a doubt, they are the best hard money lending company I have ever come across, and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show. I've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best, hands down, in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state, and if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now, this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So, Do yourself a favor, reach out to Iron Bridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. 
All right, guys, what's going on? Jonathan here. I am with Elliot Smith today. We're going to do a little bit of a different type of episode. We were catching up and having such a good chat, like I do with some guests before hitting record, that we decided to just turn this into an actual conversational podcast. We flipped it. We're going to do it on Facebook Live. Uh, for those checking this out after, we will put that out on the YouTube page as well. But we're just going to have an open dialogue conversation. So I'll bring in Elliot. He's already here. We've been chatting for about 20 minutes and figured why not just do this. So Elliot, what's going on, man? Glad what's you're up? Yeah, what's up, Jonathan? Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. We just started talking um, and then we're like, why don't we just do a joint deal? <laughs> so, you know, because we just took over the Real Deals podcast, Cole and I. Um, but I'm like, let's just throw this on our page too. Uh, sounds like you're doing a lot of cool things and just making it a conversation too. Cause I think it's always, people always forget that the hosts are doing stuff too. So. Yeah. I'm curious actually, cause that's one that I get a lot now doing daily and not having a chance to talk about my story that much. So now I'm going to be doing every five episodes, just a little personal one, one uh, blurb episode, but do you guys do any episodes on your side without any guests just like talking? Yeah, Cole and I did one, just a roundtable guest uh, when we first, the first episode while Tucker was gone. And I think it was a little test of an episode to see if we were good enough to, you know, take over the gauntlet, take over the the microphone from him because he'd been doing it for a long time. So um, Cole and I did a little roundtable discussion just talking about what we're doing to get deals, what's our business looks like and stuff like that. But sometimes I think uh, being a fly on the wall, you can get so much more than just hearing somebody talk. But if you can be a fly on the wall to having high level conversations of people, I think you can pick up a ton. Yeah, um, absolutely. The other thing, I mean, maybe maybe we won't have as much of that going on, or as much of this going on in this episode, but I feel like in a lot of podcasts, the problem is they feel, they feel scripted, they feel staged, they're not like real conversations for yeah. whatever reason. Like I'm sure you've had it interviewing people that red light starts blinking and they go into like pitch mode or they change their tone. I'm like, dude, let's just have a conversation. It would help yeah. the people. Like, so when we try to do it, it's just as if I was just going to pick your brain on something and the mic just happened to be recording and it would help almost like a, a show people a closed door conversation. So that's also what I think could be a good use of this time because we were talking about a lot of the, the stuff that you're doing wholesaling and just how you're finding off market deals and guys, how it also tied into what we're doing is some of you know, we're doing wholesaling, we're doing flipping, wholesaling in Kentucky, but it's still kind of at its like infancy. We're not doing a lot of volume and Elliot is doing a lot of volume. He's built up a lot of systems and he's been around the right people. And now he's becoming one of those people. So, um, dude, you down to just like dig into what we we're talking about before, like systems and then how, how to find deals today and what systems to use and what people need. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, Love to. So I think where we left off, and there was some screen sharing going on. I don't know if you screen share in the Facebook group too, Elliot, but I don't know if we, we need to do that part. But basically, we're just talking about pulling lists and tools to use to call on those lists and it being a little bit more of a like volume game than being as specific and trying to figure out like the perfect list and buying stuff, skip yeah. trace. So like for the beginner out there, and I'm a beginner, like if this was a coaching call right now, yeah. kind of like you were doing before, where, where do you see the mistakes? Like what mistakes was I making? And then what, what areas of improvement are there? Yeah, totally. First, I'll give a little background on who I am. So Elliot Smith, Summit Development. Um, we've ran um, a fix and flip company lifestyle business for the last five years. We, I was working 70 hours a week at my day job. Um, started doing real estate 30 hours on the side. Um, made, it, made it for a year and then saved up enough money to go full time. The you know the last four years, my wife and I have kind of traveled all over the world, Southeast Asia, Europe, you know, Hawaii multiple times, Arizona, um, and worked you know 15 to 20 hours a week each. We've been doing about 20 to 25 deals um, a year, fix and flips, um, rentals. We own 33 doors. We just bought a 24 unit um, a couple months ago, with three other guys, and we're buying an eight unit right now in in Vancouver. So anyway, so getting a lot of rentals this year, um, but we. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I've been interviewed quite a bit and spoke on stuff. And the hard part about real estate is there's so much information out there. Right. And so there's everybody, you know, everybody's got their system, like do this and you're going to kill it or do this or buy my course and then you're going to kill it Buy this course and, you know, tax deeds or, or pre foreclosures or freaking probates or all this stuff. And it is, it, people get confused. And so if somebody's just starting, I always do this because I get hit up a lot. And I always tell them, this is how I get started. If you have a full-time job, don't be ready to quit your job right away. You got to prove the process and prove the systems that it works. This business isn't for everybody. 
you got to have grit. You got to have determination. You got to like, you know, that stick to itiveness. So I tell them, you know, go download like either the driving for dollars app, which we like and use or the deal machine app. Go print out a couple maps of your areas that you want to invest in and go get a thousand, a thousand driving for dollar leads. And then just from an hour a day or two hours a day, just sit down, get like either a Google voice number or call rail number and just call them. You just need to learn to talk to people. That's the biggest thing. People don't know how to talk to people. Just call them. And I, that call would go, Hey, Jonathan Elliott Smith here. I was, uh, I was driving the neighborhood with my wife and noticed you own a property at one, two, three main street. Just wondering if you might be interested in selling or what's going on with that. And so that's really kind of how, um, I think you can really get into this game. So freaking cheap doing that. You're probably into that some time and like maybe 500 bucks on your, on your list stuff. And it's just so, going to be, yeah, dude. What you just did, first off, most people stay so, I mean, I'm sure you get this too, people that come onto the podcast, they they stay so high level. They never talk about something that you could leave the episode with and go do. So like anyone listening to the show right now can get in their car, download a free app and start driving around, put some houses into this app and then call them and you're starting the journey. So, okay. Yeah. But just a couple of quick things there for those who don't know. So like, what is deal machine? Like, why would these people want to sell their houses? Like, who are the people that they're typically calling? Are they are they putting a brand new house that was just built into deal machine? Are they putting in a house that looks like a, a beater? Like, what is it that they're doing? Yeah, first, so if you're brand new and you're like, there's two different apps out there that work really good for driving for dollars. There's the driving for dollars app, which my buddy Tucker built. And that's more like your workhorse, you're, you're pounding out lists and you're getting a list. And once you put it in there, it will skip trace it and send you the phone numbers. Deal more machines, more of the higher end. It's like a, a Rolls Royce. It's more for one-off stuff. It gets you a little bit more detailed information. So if you're just starting out, I, I would highly, or doing mass bigger lists, I'd highly recommend using the Driving for Dollars app. Um, but what I'm doing, and so then I print out a map, like a, a Google map with just the street so I can see the street names. And when I'm driving, I'm literally going down every street and just crossing off the maps. And you can use follow my tracks, but I find it just easier to just follow the map on my, and when I'm driving. So you're putting in every house on every street. No, no, no. So yeah, when we're driving, so what we're looking for, if you don't know what driving for dollars is, we're looking for houses that need work. So, and I'm looking a couple, here's my, here's my uh, basic, what we look, overgrown grass, aluminum or wood windows, ch chipping paint, older roof, moss on the roof, radio antennas is a secret weapon. If they have radio antennas, that's a secret weapon. Like, uh, you know, the ham radio towers on people's roofs that they have. Guarantee that guy's over 60 <laughs> and they've lived there a long time. Uh, wheelchair sure. ramps are a good one because they might be having issues getting in and out of their house. Um, then also older cars. So like, you know how you get those old Buicks or things like that, or multiple cars in the driveway that maybe some yep. of them are on blocks, things like that. So you're looking for some form of distress because if I'm going to go wholesale house, why would somebody sell me a brand new, perfectly redone house? And they're not going to do it. So I'm trying mm -hmm. to find a house that I can go buy for, 50 or 60 cents on the dollar and either a tie it up and sell it to some another flipper for 70 cents or i can put 20 cents into it so i'm at 70 80 cents and then i go sell it for 100 cents got um, it so and yeah how do you know what what neighborhoods or does it not matter it doesn't matter you you, you know you stay local stay where you know Every, you know i talk to people all the time they're like oh it's too expensive in my market in california or or, or seattle doesn't matter. Real estate's local. You can, yeah, you might do less deals in a, in a higher end market, but you're going to have bigger spreads in a, a more Midwest market. You're going to do more deals, hopefully, but you're going to have a lower spread because there's the houses aren't expensive. So, you know, I would stay out of war zones personally, because you're going to have a harder time, but I'm going to go middle class for my area. I'm going to go, um, I'm going to go mid medium price point areas. So entry level starter homes, maybe step up homes, which if a step up home would be so if, you know, my wife and I, we were living in a three bedroom, thousand square foot house. We had a baby, needed a little bit more space. We stepped up to an 1800 square foot home. So, okay. you know, so that middle class area. Got it. And all right. So that's a good start for people that just want to get in. Now for someone that let's say is like jumping in, maybe they've done a course, maybe they, they did a boot camp or like whatever. Now they feel like they have some tools and they're just not getting leads. So this is kind of like the conversation I haven't done. I just, I, I've picked up from mentors and people and like, we just started doing our business, but uh, other people that are like starting and let's say they carve out, let's say five or 10 grand. And that sounds probably like a lot to maybe some people listening. 
Uh, and they're like, this is my budget to start marketing, to start calling, start doing direct, mail, whatever my platforms are going to be. So I told you what we're doing. We bought some, some uh, leads that were skip traced. And then we had VAs that came through. I'm not going to name any names. Someone's uh, VA service. And they're, they're knocking out, let's say, four to 500. Uh, let's, say, let's say they're doing four to 600 calls a day. And some days they're getting leads. Some days they're not. So like someone comes to you. I'm coming to you and saying that. Where are the holes in that system? What are they doing wrong? And then what systems and ways do they need to clean that up? Okay, perfect. So I love this question. My wife and I started with 200 mailers that we paid, spent $50 on. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. And then they were the worst freaking things that you could, you, you know, I got this mailer, this letter. I was, we were trying to buy more rentals and we got, I was reading through, that's how I found bigger pockets. And I saw like wholesaling or like, you know, sending letters to get stuff. Right. So I'm like, I steal somebody's mailer on there. And we send it out and I showed it to my stepmom. She's been a realtor for 30 years. She's like, this is the worst thing. I would never call you ever. We got a call. My wife and I, we sent, we hand addressed 50 envelopes. We're sitting there in that house. I remember over on 166 and we're jumping up and down because somebody freaking called us. And so, but then a month later we got a deal. And so every dollar we made five grand on that first deal after a couple, you know, maybe five or 600 letters. And then we just put all that back into marketing. But what I tell people is this is a hard business. If it was easy, everybody'd be a millionaire doing real estate. So if you have, let's say $5,000 or $10,000 and you say you want to do um, direct mail, well, I'm going to cut that by six, my $10,000, I'm going to divide that by six, whatever I need to get going. And I'm going to run that enough to run enough mailers for six months. And I'm going to mail all those people that I put on my list or I drove for dollars and got on my list. And I'm going to mail them all consistently for six months. And I'm going to do a cycle. You can use uh, open letter marketing and you can do a nice little cycle. You can do an entry handwritten, follow up handwritten, professional, trifold, postcard. And then, you know, you can cycle that. So I'm going to do at least five or six months um, to be consistent. If I'm going to do what I said on the cold calling a thousand people, I'm going to do it for six months. Anything you do, you have to do for a while to try to get good at it. Okay. Um, and so that's how I would tell people to break their budget. If they're going to start with like, doing cold calling, you know, there is, you know, we run a cold calling service. We want people that can go more full-time. Um, not so much uh, that you're a full-time investor, but you can handle a full-time caller because, you know, if you're going to get in with us after we get a list and three month co contract, it's going to be roughly $10,000, but you're going to get a lot of leads in certain markets. You're going to get anywhere from 0.8 leads to 1.2 leads per hour. And that's 36 hours a week. So, um, but you have to have the systems like the CRMs to work on that and, you can start out really small um, and we always do consultations and we'll do like 45 minute free coaching call basically on zoom to tell people where they should go. And yeah. you know, if we're not a good fit, we tell them not a good fit. So, but yeah, you can do those things. So I would either do direct mail, do your own cold calling to start. You could hire a cold caller, but everybody swears outsource, 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 outsource everything. And then all of a sudden the money, you know, it's like hundred dollar bills rain down upon you, like from the heavens. And it's not how this game works. You got to get in the weeds and know what you're doing a little bit. All right. So let's say just, again, I don't want to like, we're trying to, trying to feed from both sides here. We want to go deep, but I, I don't want people to leave off or be confused. So, but let's say, let's say just for the beginner back to like, let's say you do find a deal, right? Yeah. Let's say, let's say that phone does ring and back to the one that you made your first 5k on. Yeah. I feel like I do this. It's a, it's not a good thing in the podcast. I only talk about, um, marketing and driving leads and getting the phone ringing yeah. because I, I feel like, Dispo is not that hard, but again, some people might find it very hard. It's so, super hard. So, so let's say you do get a lead, like you run the numbers, uh, you find that there's enough spread. Like you, you send it to a realtor who says, yeah, this is way under value. And I said that just because people, I, they want to know how do I price this thing? Is it a good deal or not? You send it to a realtor. They're like, you got something here. Like there's something here. There's enough room. Now you have to dispo it or assign the contract or flip it or do whatever. How do you decide exit strategy? And then like, how do you go with that exit strategy? Well, I'm even going to back up a little bit more because I think people, people underestimate, like if you're good with people, you can talk to people, but if you don't know the hell you're doing, you know, you're going to sound like a knucklehead, you know, to a certain extent, that's fine. You know, that's how you learn. And so, you know, when that call comes in, I have a script that, you know, that I stick to every time if that phone rings. I say, Hey, this is Elliot. Um, and they say, Hey, this, you know, you sent me a letter or whatever. And I'm like, great. What's the property address? And then maybe a little banter. And I'm like, great. So, um, are you interested in selling or calling for more information? 
And then they'll, what it doesn't matter what they say. Um, and so then I'll go, okay, great. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we work and you kind of tell me how you'd like to proceed. Does that sound fair? Perfect. So what we do is we drive certain neighborhoods we're interested in buying houses in. Uh, we don't do a ton of research on the front end, um, but when somebody like yourself calls in, we'll talk to them a little bit about the property and uh, see if we might be a good fit for an appointment to come walk your property and then make you an all cash offer. So what we normally tell people is if your house has been fully updated, 2020 standards, new roof, new kitchens, new bathroom, siding, windows, things like that, your best bet's always going to be the retail market. But if your house does need some work, like you haven't put a roof on it in 10 or 15 or 20 years, you know, the kitchens and bathrooms could stand to be updated. It's got older windows, siding, needs some paint like that. Then we're a great fit because we have in-house contractors that can get the work done quite a bit cheaper. Um, so, and then I shut up and then I let them tell me which box they fit in. And if they fit in the retail box, I say, great, do you have a realtor? I, you know, I have a realtor that I work with. They're awesome. I'd love to refer you. Most of the time at that point, they're, they'll say, no, my cousin's a realtor or whatever. My mom's sister's brother's a realtor. Um, but then if they say I'm in box two, then they have raised their hand and told you that they fit in your program. Now they have given the authority back to you that they fit your program. So that gives you the power. Then you go have the conversation. What's the situation? What's going on? Why are you thinking about selling? You know, then you get in there. What do you think the property is worth? What would you, what do you think you, you want to sell it for? If they have a good reasonable price, you set an appointment. And then what I did when I first started is I actually, um, I partnered with a, a guy that does a ton of flips and I would just say, Hey, um, are you interested in this property at one, two, three main street? You have to trust them. So I go partner with a guy that I trust has a good reputation. That's experience and say, Hey, I'm going to try to feed you some deals. Um, because I didn't know shit about construction. I didn't know anything about anything on construction. And so then he'd say, yeah, I'd be interested in buying it. I say, okay, what would you go? What would you buy this for? I'd send him the pictures. What would you buy this for? And he'd say 180. So then I try to go get it for less than 180 and anything I make less than 180. There we go. And so then after a while, you know, you want to learn more. So then I started hiring an inspector to go with me for like, you know, a half discount. He wouldn't do any reports or anything. He just walked through the property with me and tell me, you can do this. This is going to be an issue. This is going to be an issue. This blah, blah, blah. And so then I can learn more and I started growing and then I started learning how to price them better myself. Do you think if someone sticks with this for six months and they have a decent budget and they do the things that like are plug and play, like anyone can be successful in this? No. Why? Because we live in a society where people want things right now and they think it's easy, you have to have work ethic. You have to understand that this is a business. You have to understand that this is a people business. And if you're, you don't like or have compassion because you're dealing with people in hard situations, if you don't have empathy or compassion for people, you're going to struggle. You know, I can build relationships within 30 seconds with people. You know, I go into a house and it's an older lady and I say, I'm a hugger, you know, and you know, COVID or whatever, you know, but I'm a hugger. And then I start talking about my kids or I start talking about struggling with depression, anxiety, um, substance abuse, things like that, where they can relate to me. I pick out pictures. You have to be, you have to have that. So, you know, I think you can be success. Anybody can be successful with the right mindset and the right team. So like my wife, she's not a people person. So she would struggle on the people side. I'm not an accounting side or a computer side type of person or um, organized or anything like that. If you saw that my office right now, you you know, <laughs> but I need her too. So you need to, you need to have a good mixture of a team or people to work with as well. You can't do everything you can when you start, if you, if you're good with people and you can build rapport and things like that, you can, but it's hard. You know, I, even this year has been tough for us. We, you know, we were doing 25 flips a year and we're probably only bought like eight houses this year with COVID. And it's just, you have to be able to weather those storms. Um, you know, you got to not press when you, um, when you're not buying houses, you know, we, we looked at a lot of deals, but none of them penciled out. And you just, luckily we have money that we just don't press, you know, we live well below our means and, um, you know, we don't have to buy deals. So what is your, well, how has COVID affected wholesaling and flipping and where do you think it's going to like go in the next year? Um, well, so I mainly just rehab now, so I'm not doing a, any, every now and then we'll wholesale stuff, but um, I think it's, it's, it's paralyzed people. I think this year is probably the best way to describe it. Or people are paralyzed in a lot of ways. Um, you have a very contentious, uh, media and election going on that, mm -hmm. um, is very polarizing and there's a lot of fear being driven. Uh, you have a coronavirus that is being driven a lot of fear. Um, people don't 
you know, people are, aren't working, they're staying at home, they're told us to not leave their house. So they're just like, they're paralyzed. They don't know what to do. And so uh, that's why inventory is so low because it's, it's not because houses are just selling that much faster or better. It's because there's no houses because no, most people don't want to sell. They don't want people in their house. They don't want to do this stuff. So you're looking for um, situations that you need to help in. So there's just less people that are mobile. Less people are mobile unless they're leaving like the, the bigger cities like the San Francisco's or the Seattle's because they can get out of the high living. Yeah. But you don't want to be in those markets. You know, don't be in the condo market in San Francisco right now. <laughs> I'm glad I don't own Airbnbs in San Francisco. Um, but I think, you know, then interest rates are extremely low. I think people see the markets on fire. So if they are ready to sell, you know, we walked a lot of houses that we would normally buy, but they want 90 cents on the dollar instead of 70 cents on the dollar a year ago. And so um, expectations have also changed. Um, interest rates, you know, change a lot of things. Then the, the amount of inflation, the Fed pumping money into the, you know, the economy and um, tenants not moving, not being able to be evicted, there's less inventory there. So it's, it's just a harder, it's a harder deal. Um, and I've really, you know, one of my metaphors for this year, because I've got really down on myself early in the year with COVID and I'm like, you know, I'm looking at this year as like a catapult. I got everybody can see it. You know, I got a catapult. My buddy bought this for me because I was using this metaphor. It's like this year, it might not be the best year for like money wise. Like we're still doing fine. But every day I'm working my butt off to pull that catapult down, add more leads, add more contacts, add more things into my my bucket. So when the floodgates do open, then I'm ready to slam this thing out and I'm going to shoot it up and I'm going to kill it. And so that's how I'm equating this year. So I'm still looking at it as a positive. Love that. Haven't heard that. Someone actually bought you the catapult because you were using it that much. Yeah, I was using that metaphor. And my my really good friend, Greg, he was on the podcast last week. Um, we do a two-week accountability call. And he bought me one and he bought himself one. And actually, it's a really good one. Freaking, you put a peanut or something there, freaking stings <laughs> it. My two-year-old loves it. He's like, more, more every time we do it. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah, no, it's a good metaphor. I think a lot of people are just not sure... You, dude, you hear both sides of it. And like, it's the funniest thing that I find right now is the people that are that are not buying deals themselves, but they're doing paid coaching or paid mastermind telling other people to buy deals. I'm like, come on, man, which I get, which is smart because they're not buying deals, but they can make money. But, and and again, actually, I don't even want to judge it. Some people- uh, I, I am selling coaching for $9,995 <laughs> since I'm not buying any deals. <laughs> like, like I, I do I do think, you're not, are you dumb? No? Yeah, I'm just no, I'm kidding. I'm not selling coaching. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. like, I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is, okay, I'm not judging it because you know what? Maybe you could use this here to get educated. And sometimes having a coach or, or a mentor, I think it's a great thing actually. But if the person is is eating their own dog food, I, I hate to see when someone is coaching, teaching, guruing, mentoring, when they've stopped doing what they're making money on as teaching. Cause like, then you're not like, you're not as sharp. You're, you're not an expert as you are to the person that's in the trenches every day and still picking up the best practices. You've devoted energy and time into now becoming a really good teacher and a really good marketer and like nothing wrong with it. But I don't know, like there you hear is, both though, sides of it. There is some ethic in my opinion. Like there's, so I'm taking, took over Tucker Mary, who I think he was on your show last week. Yeah. Um, I've been part of his like little DFA group and I paid him for some, just some, you know, hour long coaching stuff. And he's been my good buddy for a while, but you know, the, the thing I respected about him the most was he actually does the business every day. You know, he, he's trying his marketing, he's trying different marketing, he's trying new things out. We're seeing what works. Um, if you're just, if you're not in the trenches and you're selling people how to go do stuff, yeah, it might've worked two years ago, but you know, Okay, that, that'd be like me being a coach and saying, you know, go send 10,000 yellow letters. Well, that worked really good in 2012, old guy. But, you know, things have changed. You know, now the marketing strategies are more um, targeted direct mail, high quality mail pieces with then and then wide net list would be a cold calling and text messaging. Um, mm -hmm. And there is some niche things you can do in between there. Um, but I get these postcards from these people all the time with these final notice at all my rentals and all final notice this. And I'm like, who's who calls on this garbage? You know, who's selling? I hate those. Those are yeah. the worst. Yeah. It's like, who's selling you this shit? You know what I mean? But like, okay. So, so I don't I mean, I, I, I'm glad we talked about that, but I guess where I was going with it is like, you hear people this year that are saying, wait, you hear people that are saying like, go forward. And, and I guess this is kind of where I was going with it. Like questioning the motivations a bit. Like I joke around my syndicator friends who are all like best time ever to buy deals. I'm like, 
is it like, or are you going for fees? Like, let's yeah. talk about this for a sec. Cause yeah. like they make money when they do deals and it doesn't matter like how, how fat their returns are, how, how strong their returns are. Like they are making money on the buy and then they'll hopefully make more money if it's successful. But like their salary is based on fees on the upfront. So I'm like, it's hard. I'm finding it harder to get neutral information from. I love their, uh, their estimated three to five year IRR. You know what I mean? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, I was like talking to Ken McElroy. Um, he's a rich dad. Uh, he's Robert Kiyosaki's, you know, advisor or whatever. He owns like 10,000 units. And he said they were selling one of their apartments and they own 10,000 units. They're selling one of their apartments and they had it maxed out. Like it was, you know, going to, it needed to go to like a institutional buyer for like a, a reach or something. He got it shot back to him from a syndicator, 20% below market rents, you know, ex estimated IRR. It's just like, Wait, <laughs> like guys a a syndicator was trying to, a syndicator was trying to buy it. Yes. Or? A syndicator was trying to tie it or tie it up and then, or had it tied up and then was trying to syndicate it. <laughs> and was, so it's like, you have no idea, dude. Damn. Like, like there wasn't any value to add. And no, he's thinking there is no, this, got he, it. Yeah. It's like, this guy's a professional, been doing it for 25 years, done over, you know, owns over 10,000 units. And, you know, as a full company, you think that he know, he knows when his value, he sells at the top of the value, not a freaking, you know, uh, a value at apartment. Cause he's got to find another one anyway. Why would he sell a value at apartment? <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's... yeah, it's, uh, here's what my thought process is, is I'm already, <laughs> fire aim kind of person. If you do what we talked about 10 minutes ago and, and go get a thousand names and just think of this year as a catapult year, you're going to learn. So if I light $10,000 on fire, like most kids, you know, you can light $10,000 on fire in, in a couple of different ways. You can light it on fire in real estate and you can write it, light it on fire or in way more in college, getting a woman's study degree. Right. And so if I'm going to light it on fire, I'm going to do it in something that I have a potential to actually make my money back. So Let's go get a thousand people, go learn how to talk to people, use the next two months. It's going to be slower anyway. Use the next two months, have some conversations. If something comes up, great. Keep your expectations low. But what you're doing, if you have a good, if you can get a basic podio or whatever, you can start adding leads or people you talk to, talk to in there. And it goes back to it's a catapult year. So when you start, when the floodgates open, you have all these people that you've already talked to that you're following up, you're building a relationship with. So 2021 comes around, elections over, everything smooths out, hopefully. COVID yeah. starts to go away. Then all of a sudden in the, everything opens, you've already got 30, 40, 50 people that you've been talking to. Do you see a lot of, or, or like talks in your circles, do you see a lot of distress coming that there will be opportunity to do more flips, wholesales, whatever, or no? Nah? I, I do a lot of research on there, this stuff and the money. There's two camps and there's camp. One is the world and the sky is going to fall down. And there's camp two that, the sky's not going to fall because inflation is going to keep home prices from dropping. So, yes, technically, if it's if it's uh, if it's number one, they're looking at you can't evict people. There's going to be a mass evictions. But some states, when the eviction ban was lifted for a little bit, the evictions weren't that much higher. Um, step two, you know, same on that is the forbearances. Well, they can add that to the end of their loan. Yeah, there's going to be some inventory, but it's going to be gobbled up. I'm my good my business partner. They buy at the auctions. They've been doing it for 20 years. There was like two houses going last week and there was like 50 people there with cash ready to go. And this is in a smaller town. So, I mean, people have cash and right. people, you know, people have been saying for, you know, on bigger pockets for frigging the last, since I started, there's a crash coming, there's a crash coming, save your money. So like we should have kept so many deals, but I bought into that mindset of like, there's a crash coming. So I'm going to stack my cash so I can buy better deals. No, if it's a good deal today, if it's rents, if it's a good deal, if you can get in and out of it in three to six months, you know, buy it. You know, if you're, if you're new, if you know what you're doing and you have more cash, you can weather a storm, then you can do bigger deals. Um, camp two is that um, asset inflation has been very large in the last 10 years. And that um, I talked to some guys that, that were Wall Street guys, been on work for a Wall Street on Wall Street company. And they think asset inflation is going to be a lot higher in the next 10 years than what is in the last so the feds printed and added 22 percent more money into the money supply this year alone. So if we look at that and look at lumber, lumber prices are up like 40 percent year over year, um, if not more, um, depending on the time. They're up like freaking from 250 or 300 uh, uh, linear or whatever to like 990 in, in July. 
Um, mm. I mean, triple. And so they're back down a little bit, I think in this five or six hundreds. But so if I'm buying this asset, can I build this asset for less than what I'm buying it for? That's a, that's a thought process there. And so also if there's inflation rises with the Fed with what they want to do, yeah, the house prices might not drive it, might not level out. It's just taking more dollars to buy that property. So that's mm -hmm. the form of the way the price is dropping. It's just taking more dollars to buy that property. So what does all that mean? That means I just get started. Just go for it. Just be protect yourself. If you don't have a ton of money in your bank, go find a go find a Jonathan in your market. Go find an Elliot in your market. Go find somebody that's doing a lot of these deals. Um, go creep on people and just find somebody that you feel like is a good guy and a good or a good gal that's that's doing this and say, hey, I'm learning. I don't want to waste your time, so I don't need anything from you right now. But I'm gonna go find some deals. And what I want to do is I want to send you pictures and an address, and I need you to tell me what you would pay for it, and then I'm gonna go try to lock it up for less than that. So then, and, but you need to find somebody that's closing deals. That's, you know, they're doing 10, 20, 30 deals and they'll put money down to make sure you're not backing out of the contract. Um, but go find one or two of those guys. Like I tell people all the time, come to me. I'll tell you that like people do this all the time. I'll tell you exactly what I'll pay for it. And if you can get it for less, I'll buy it. And it's, if I say I'm going to do it, it doesn't matter if I put money down or not, I'm buying that fucking house because you're putting your name on the line. So, um, you know, people will tell you, go tie these up with a hundred dollar earnest money go tie them up, you know, with a three week extension or claw inspection. So you have all these outs. No, just go find one person. That's all you need. You need the deal is more important than the buyer. Cause there's lots of cash out there. That's really good, man. Seriously. Yeah. It's really good. Everybody says to build a huge buyer's list, but you don't know what you're freaking selling. You know what I mean? That's at the end of the day. Is this a rental? Is this, this just worry about one freaking guy. That's all you need. Whether you make $2,000 or 5,000, you're basically his partner. You're not even wholesaling at that point. You're basically his partner. You just go find the deal and get paid out on the front. And I did that for our first 40 deals, 30, 40 deals. I want to talk about flipping a little bit. Is there anything else you want to mention on wholesaling or we should talk about? Uh, one thing I would talk about is know that when you tie up a house, that's somebody's mother, that's somebody's brother, that's somebody's sister, somebody's dad, grandma, whatever. Just think when you're locking that property up, if that was your mom and you did what you're doing, would you feel good about yourself? Because there's so many people that have, will tie people up. They expect they're going to move. They expect they're getting cash off or they're getting ready. And then you, you walk last minute because you don't actually have the money. Make sure you you do the right thing by people and you're going to be successful. I can't tell you how many friends of sellers I have on my Facebook friends list because they love me. They want to see pictures of Monty because they, I treat them right. They know I'm making money. People are fine with you making money. There's nothing wrong with that. Just, yeah. just do the right thing and be a freaking decent human being. Dude, you're not a bad guy. I know sometimes, you know, my wife, you know, she beats me up a little bit, but <laughs> you're not that bad, dude. I like it. Yeah. Um. All right, man. Flipping. What's, what's the, Man, what's the crash course on flipping in 2020? Is it is it doable? Is it yeah. a, a is it a profitable business in 2020 and going yeah. into 2021? Yeah, if you know your numbers and you stick to like one product type, like we only basically do entry level and step up homes, like in both markets. Like I won't touch like you know, there's a lot of guys that will do 100, 200 thousand dollar remodels. We won't touch them. I mean, sometimes a remodel will hit 100 because we you know, there's a lot of shit that ends up having to be done. Right. But we're staying in the 40 to I mean, actually 30 to $60,000 rehab range. So we're basically just doing kitchens, bathrooms, roof, windows, uh, paint, carpet, flooring. That's it. We're not doing right. more. Let's, let's do a scenario because I feel like what, like people may, it may, it may be easier than some people think to find a deal. If you're, if you're in all the right Facebook groups and you're on the wholesaler list, let's say people feel that they're getting deal flow on a daily basis. Do those deals suck? Maybe. Are they great? Maybe. Who knows? So let's say they're getting hit with 10 deals a day between wholesale email lists. And for those that don't know, that just means like the people we were talking about before, the people that find off-market deals, mm -hmm. they get out email lists, you get on their list, they'll send you their quote unquote off-market deals. Then it's up to you to decide if there is there any meat on this bone. Same thing for Facebook groups. There's deals posted in all these investor groups. Hey, I got a single family in this town or whatever. All right. So for the person that's listening right now, and they're maybe they could, if they wanted to see 10 deals in a day and they're like, all right, how do I, I, I don't even, one, I don't know where to get started. I don't know how much the rehab is going to cost. I don't know mm -hmm. if these have ARV that's going to make me any money. And then they're like, I'm not going to do anything because that's too hard to figure out. So nah, what do I do? it's super simple. 
first okay. it goes back to my my process you need a you need a I, my guy's name is Corey. Uh, Corey what? I, Corey, my, my partner, my business partner's oh, name is Corey. Hey, so Corey. we partner on flips and I learned a lot from him, but I had a couple other guys before that I was wholesaling stuff too, but super simple. I know in my market, a kit, brand new kitchen is going to cost me $8,000. I know a roof's going to cost me anywhere, probably four to $5,000, depending on the size of the house. I start pricing these things out and knowing what it's going to cost me. And you can do a general thing. You can buy Jay Scott's estimating rehab cost book and dive into that, but I hate reading those kind of things. I just, they get bored. I love to read, but I hate reading like do this and do this. I can't, I, you know, I put a bullet in my head. Um, so, you know, go find a Corey or somebody that's doing flips and just being like, Hey, you know, I want to go, I'm going to go find you some deals. And then once you bring him one deal or whatever, then they want to talk to you. Then they want to be your friend. Okay. Then I just say, Hey, can I just come ride along with you for a day and just ask you questions? And so, but you've already added value to Corey because you brought him a deal, right? Because now Corey's like, okay, now I can put some time in this. Because I get hit up all the time. Hey, can I take you out to lunch? Can I take you out to coffee? Can I pick your brain? No, you know, fuck, I'm sorry. Do something for me, you know, make it, make me want to talk to you. You know what I mean? And I was, yeah. and so when I first started, I did the same thing. I, I, I would go find, I found a deal. I called the guy off a of bigger pockets that I've been talking to. I got this deal. What the frick did I do? I don't know what to do. <laughs> I didn't even know about wholesaling, you know? So yeah. um, go figure that out. And then you go ride around That's with good. them and then say, okay, let's go look at some of your projects. What's uh, what's the kitchen? What the kitchen cost you roughly? You know, does he have in-house contractors? Does he have hire out contractors? If you hire out good GCs, it's going to cost you about 40% more than if you have, you know, hire out subs that are maybe a little bit harder to manage. I'm going to ask him what the kitchen cost you. What do you, what did it cost to floor this 1200 square foot house? what it costs to do the bathrooms. You know, I know bathrooms, I can usually get them done for a thousand if I to $2,000, depending on how much I have to do. So then I go through and I overestimate. So I do this all the time right now. I just did it yesterday on a deal. Um, okay. Say, you know, it's going to cost me this much for this, this much for this, this much for this. And I come up with $40,000 for the rehab budget. So I'm going to add an extra 10,000 on there because shit never goes right. And I always want to yeah. be careful. So now I'm at 50 and let's say, um, let's just use this deal for example, yesterday. It's probably a 220 house and it probably will press to 230 in this market. I'm going to comp that house and I'm going to look at everything. What is sold that is exactly the same. And if you're doing a mid, um, you know, you're doing a, a median income house, there's going to be a lot of comps. So what is sold in the last six months that looks that I want this house to look like. So it's just rehabbed, refreshed and looks good. Um, what is that sold for? So say they're selling for, they're selling for 210 to 220. I'm going to take the 210. So now my ARV, instead of what I think, 220, 230, my ARV is 210. So I know I can sell it for 210. So I've gotten 10,000 more on less on the what I think I can sell it for. And I've gotten 10,000 more on the rehab. So now mm -hmm. I've created margin, right? It's a margin of error. And so that's going to be the important thing. So then I just go to my calculator and it's super simple. I go, okay, 210 minus my selling costs. In Washington State, we have excise tax. It, with a realtor, um, it costs me about... 0.925% or seven and a half percent to sell houses usually. And that's sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but that's a good average. So I go times 0.925. Okay. So now I'm at 194. Then I do minus my 50 K. Okay. And that's 144. Now I want to make minimum on my deals. I want to make 30. So I'm going to add in there. I know I'm going to have some holding costs. I know I'm going to have, you know, maybe we use our own cash a lot, but maybe I have some private money. So let's just say, um, if I want to make a minimum 30, let's just put 40 on there. So I'm a little heavy on that. So I want to make 40, right? That should cover all my costs and some only costs. So that gets me right here to 104,000, 250. And I do that exact math problem in front of the seller. I will break that down. Mr. Seller, what do you think your house is worth fixed up? 210. How much do you think it's going to cost you to fix it? I'm 40 to 50 grand. Let's go with 50. Here's my numbers. Are you fair? Are you good with all that? They can't argue with math. So there's my offer, Mr. Seller, 104,250. And I'd say I'd be between 100, 100 to 105. And then I've created margin on both sides. So if it sells, and this always happens, it always sells for more than we think it's going to sell for, especially in this up market. But mm -hmm. shit could hit the fan in, what is it, 10 days. You know, November 3rd, shit could hit the fan. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it's just the way the world is. You know, yeah. Trump doesn't get elected. He might burn this house down on his way out. True. And, and so, and Biden gets elected, you know, he might have a stroke on the way to the inauguration. So, <laughs> so, um, anyway, that was not a political, I'm not for or against either one. You make your own decisions, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, um, volatility though. what's that? 
No, it just could be volatility either way. You yeah, either know. way. So we don't know, but I've created margin. Now I know that I can also have enough margin that if I put $50,000 in that house and it's still a 2000, 210 house, but the market's you know harder to sell if something's happening, I can still refi that out and I can pull majority of my cash out of that property and turn it into a rental. And I built that, I remodeled that house because we're not putting granite. We're not putting super high end flooring. We're putting basic builder grade stuff, always the same um, for mica countertops, white cabinets, stainless steel appliances, um, same vinyl, same carpet in every house, rental or not. I know that I can rent it and I can cover my nut. So, um, and you're going to be able to, as long as you have a job, you can go refi it, you know, um, and refi and you'll pull all your cash out for your 50K. You'll pay off your lenders um, if you have lenders and you should be able to rent that house. And like, I would be able to rent that same house right there for $1,400 a month my loan would be 160 maybe. And that, that loan payment is going to be 12, 1300 bucks. And then I make two, 300 bucks and I weather a storm. Yeah. And you got a rental for free. And you got a rental for free. So that's really the thought process, but it's when people start getting in trouble as they see these freaking stupid shows on HGTV that my wife watches all the time. And they're like, you know, moving walls, they're doing granite, they're doing all these freaking showers. And it's like, you don't start there. You know what I mean? That's just not where you start. You do freaking basic stuff and we do it the same way. We have a freaking list and we just say, how much are we doing? We need, these are our SKUs for Home Depot or Lowe's. These are our SKUs. We send it to our pro desk. We tell them how many we need. They pull it all for us and they ship it to us in freaking in sections. Dude, that's awesome. I mean, I go to my rehabs like three or four times. I have a contractor, my guy that's in house that does all our stuff. He's remodeling our 20, a lot of our units in our 24. Same shit. I never go there. I don't have to because he just knows the process. The one thing why we also have margin is twice this year, we've had to put new sewer lines in and pull an oil tank out. So that was $30,000 in, in two houses. We still made on one of them, it was like $20,000 we spent extra. We still made 56,000 on the house because we had margin. Hmm. Where do you think most people get it wrong with contractors? Contractors suck. They trust Bro, them. our whole our whole they, listenership is contract. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know that's fine. You suck. You need to get better. <laughs> I don't think I don't think any contractors listen, so you could say that. But but no. what, what what can people do to be better with contractors? Or is it or is it their fault? Or are they it's, just technicians trying to be operators? It's their fault. It's your fault, and it's the contractor's fault as well. So contractors are hard because they will take advantage of you, and the contractors that you need to run this business successfully are guys that need their hands held a lot of times and they're not the most organized. If you, if you have a dialed contractor, that's very organized, systematized, professional, they're going to cost you 40% more, right? That's just the way it is. They're doing remodels for, you know, you know, millionaire next door people for the most part or building houses or whatever the guys you need, you know, they're making 60, $80,000 a year trying to, they like working by themselves or they have a one or other guy for a helper. They're not that organized. They're trying to do work and then try to do books at night. That's the problem. So you have to set expectations. And I've freaking screwed it up so many times. You know, I've tried to put guys on salary. I've tried to put them on bids. I've tried to put them, you know, I had one guy that, um, you know, he bid the project and he always bid too low. And so then he'd run out of money. And then he's always trying to cut corners and then do side work because he's got to make more money. And then, um, or he's like a, he's a whirlwind. He'll start the kitchen one day. And instead of doing finishing what he started there, he'd go to the bathroom and then maybe go to the roof the next day. And then, you know, he's all over the board. So you have to hold a lot of their hands, but once you find a good one, take really good care of them. So we have in-house guys and we have three in-house crews and we just take really good care of them. You want a weekend off, take a weekend off or, or a week, you know, a couple of weekdays off, take it off. I don't give a shit. You want to do, um, you want to work 10 hours today or work four tens. I don't really care just do a good job and here's the systems and fought line these systems and they'll take care of you. And, you know, still their, their own boss. We 1099 them. Um, we pay them, you know, one of my guys, I pay 35 bucks an hour, 37 bucks an hour. The other, his helper, I pay 20 in Vancouver. We're a little bit cheaper, but we house one of our, we bought a rent, we bought a house and one of our contractors needed a rental here, fix it. You can have this one at, you know, below market. Cause you need a place to live. You know, we take care of those guys. That's a good tip. And so, yeah, it's uh then also just know that uh, a lot of contractors have abuse, drug abuse, uh, alcohol abuse. A lot of those guys that you're going to be working with are going to struggle with that stuff. Uh, maybe not all of them, but a, a fair amount. So make sure you're aware of those things. Um, a lot of them can be more erratic. You know, they're not working a job and they're not 
a big contractor for a reason. So how do you, um, you have to manage them and manage their expectations and make sure everything's spelled out um, very well. Anything else, man? This has been awesome so far. I'm just thinking about if there's anything else we need to talk about. It's really good. Um, no, I mean, I just get into it. Just go figure it out. I mean, that's the, that's the thing. I mean, like you're doing, man, you're jumping in, you're, you're doing some deals. Um, you know, if you say you get a really good deal, right, Jonathan, like you said, you were going to do a wholesale, and you say yep. you get, you get a sweet deal. You got like a deal, you got like $80,000 spread, but you don't know how to take it down. You don't have the money. You don't want to go pull hard money or whatever. You know, I had guys come to me and they're like, Hey, you want to partner with me on this deal? And I'm like, sure, I'll buy it. Like I'll buy it. I'll put the money in. We'll wholesale and we'll split a 50, 50 easy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But dude, I gotta, I gotta make all the money myself, man. No, I gotta, you know, people, I gotta, I gotta do all this myself. I can't give any of the deal away. Why would I no, do that? No, man. I've made so that's what happened to the guy that, that I first was wholesaling all those deals to. He screwed me. He screwed me a couple of times. Dude, that guy's an idiot. He freaking lost so much money. I would have partnered because I'm loyal to a fault. And so he screwed me on a couple of deals and man, you can go so much farther together. Like people get so short sighted. They're like, see five, I can make five grand right now. If I just cut this guy out of the deal or go back on my word, I can pay, make an extra five grand. You're an idiot. How much money, how much future income did you lose working with that guy? Dude, all of it. And you didn't probably do the deal right yourself. Yeah. You probably screwed it up. You probably left money on the table. <laughs> you come to me, I will maximize that. It's just like with a good realtor, they're going to get you more money than their fee is going to cost. Fact. Dude, that's so good. That's so good. Cause I think people, it's like, I, I don't know what it is. It's funny. Cause you have syndicators on one side that they're doing these deals and it's barely any of their own money. And then you have people that are on the far other side that want to do the whole deal themselves. They don't want to say they have one partner and it's ego in the way that's either stopping them from doing any deals. Cause they have to give up equity or money that yeah. they would make, but they wouldn't make anyway if they didn't have a partner yeah. and it stops them from doing it. So it's like, I see both yeah. sides, but if it's a way I, I to get too. started, you got to do it. Yeah. So, but if somebody brings me a fatty deal right now or a good deal, um, well, I wouldn't have got that deal in the first place. I wouldn't have bought that deal. I would have made no money. So why not partner with this guy? Give him half the deal. If I'm still making my 30 grand, I want to make, you know, then who gives a shit? You know right. what I mean? The, I'm still making 30 grand more than I would have if this guy wouldn't have called me. <laughs> so that's how you got to look at it. And same, you know, if you get a good deal or you get something and you go screw it up, well, you made zero dollars, but if you call me, I guarantee I'll close it. I'll find a way to get it done. If there's a deal to be had there, you can go screw this up in so many different ways. So then say that same deal, if you screw it up, you lose 30 grand potentially, or you're 60, but you made zero dollars. You come to me, you make 30. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah. Really not much more I get out on that. Yeah, no. Cool. So yeah, I think, uh, you can over network though too. People over network. You just need a small circle. You need a very small circle. Like you can meet new people and grow and grow different people and, and throw different people, but you don't need a ton of people. That's one I have not heard before over networking. I've heard over educating, but I haven't heard over networking. That's good. Well, well, think about it. It's the same as over educating. You go talk to this guy and he's doing this strategy. So you're like, fuck, I'm going to go do that strategy. Or then you talk to another guy and he's doing this strategy. I'm going to go do that strategy. You know, I hear, I do this all the time. I'm squirrel, 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 squirrel. You know, you got to learn to say no, get your core group, stick with them, go learn some shit. And then if you need to grow out of this person, like I did with my first guy I was wholesaling deals to, if I, need, I needed to grow out of him, I went and found another guy that was better next step up. You can still talk to this guy unless they screw you, then don't talk to him, but you can still talk to him. Just do less deals and go to another guy. And if they say anything, this I can go farther with this, this guy. You know what I mean? And you don't have to, we don't have an LLC between my partner and I, it's all on a handshake. Yep. Granted, I would not recommend that. Um, <laughs> so please, you know, seek a lawyer and put a partnership or something in writing because most people aren't, people will step on you for money. Yeah. And so have something in writing, but my partner and I have done over 80 deals all on a handshake. Sometimes he buys them. Sometimes I buy them. Sometimes he puts it, he buys them and puts them in my name. Sometimes I buy them and put them in his name. It's just, um, but I trust him. You know I mean? I, I stay at his house. I'm like one of his kids. And so, and he's just a freaking great dude. I mean, find somebody that you want to be like. That's what I'm always looking. I did that when I worked for Franz. When I started out part-time and I want to be full-time, I worked with a full-time guy. When I went full-time and I wanted to get a route, I went and rode with a route guy on my days off. When I wanted to, when I got a route and I wanted to be a supervisor, I went and rode with supervisors on my day off. I Go find somebody that's 
the next step of where you want to be or a little bit above you, go make that friends with them, go add value to them and then, then learn from them. And if they don't want to go farther, then you can go find somebody else. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, yeah. But make, make yourself valuable. People forget this. They want it now. Give it to me. I deserve this. I don't, you know, whatever go. No, you are a servant. You need to be a servant in this business. You need to serve your sellers. You need to serve your partners and you need to serve everybody that you work with. Elliot, man, this is awesome. What's, what's uh next for you, man? What, what are you thinking? Or where can people find you? What's next and where can people find you? So we're still doing deals. I'm on Instagram. It's just EL Smith 739. Okay. Um, and then we started a call center this year. Um, out of the, uh, my, my, my partner, Cole, that runs the podcast with us. Also, he actually, uh, he started a couple of years ago for his own business. He had like 20 callers going just for his own business at 20 years old. Um, so then he scaled that back, let some buddies use it. I was using it. So I'm like, Hey, I think I can help you with your sales and these guys and training. So he's like, why don't you partner with me? And we sell it. And then we partner with Tucker Maryhew and we're freaking just blowing it up. Guys are using are just killing it with the call center. Um, so that's callmagicleads.com. Um, we're implementing, we're doing it for realtors too. The realtor that we, uh, um, started the beta test with, uh, we called for him for free for three days. So he could test it within an hour and a half. He said, I want this for the entire Portland market. He's uh, got a 10 people on his team. First two weeks, he locked up four listings in Portland and probably a median price of like 600,000. Um, and we only charged him $5,000 a month and he's probably gonna lock up eight listings this month. So, um, we're going expanding that to more realtors. Um, we're doing some text messaging campaigns for select few because you got to really be dialed to do the text. We're doing done for you text messaging campaigns, which nobody's really doing. So running call magic. I was in Tijuana last week. I put a, we're working on putting a call center in Tijuana um, so we can have uh, bilingual callers. And also there's a lot, um, you know, this is a little bit higher, um, more people that have lived in the U.S. that maybe got deported. Um, that can have conversational English um, and understand rapport. So just working my ass on that. Uh, I'm really scared of inflation. So we've added, um, what is that? 29 units so far this year, a 24 unit, two duplex as a single family. And I'm adding an, buying an eight unit right now. So that'd be 37. That's over $4 million worth of real estate, three and a half million dollars worth of real estate that we've added this year. Cause mm -hmm. I want to get as many 2020 dollars in, in 2020 um, because I think that asset inflation is going to be huge in the next 10 years. So I want to, you know, I'm buying gold and silver, some stuff too. And just enjoying my kid, man. I got a two year old and he's freaking the cutest thing ever and trying to be a good husband. And, you know, with my erratic, impulsive, alcoholic nature, it's sometimes you know, I screw that up. Um, but trying to, you know, trying to be better every day and trying to live life, man. And that's kind of what we're doing. Dude, this is fun. Let me ask yeah, you, I haven't got to ask good. you any questions. So you got, we got, we got five more minutes. You think? Let's do it. All right. Five, 10 more minutes. You, I mean, we got some. Yeah. I mean, people like it. So, okay. You were telling me you're, you're three deals in, you're just picking up a whole tail. You're going about to yeah, go yeah. full time. So why, what are you, you're in Kentucky, you're doing stuff in Louisville. What, um, what's been your biggest challenge? piecing together a lot of different methodologies. I was just on the phone with uh, somebody yesterday. I'm not going to say the name, but somebody in the space. And it's like everybody at Teams has a little bit of a different flavor that they're all gung-ho about. Like my system with call tools and I get my leads here and then we follow up this way. And like, if you don't follow this exact system, it's like a broken system. So piecemealing some of it from a couple different places has been has been the challenge. And that's what it. I think we were talking about before, you know, like streamlining some of that. Yeah. And so, yeah, my Cole, Cole's freaking so good at systems. And after we hop off, I'll show you kind of my, um, you know, actually, I can, you want me to show you some of my systems? Because I think you were looking at doing um, Justin's CRM, right? Yeah. Can we yeah, yeah, can we screen share in here, people? Sorry if, uh, if you're not watching, uh, if you're on the podcast, but um, I'm going to show you my systems a little bit. So. Let's go. So I use, I use OLM hub uh, CRM, but I've, I've upgraded a little bit and there's so much stuff, right? You see these CRMs and there's just so much stuff. Like you're like, so right now this is Podio and then is OLM Podio. is what? Just for, for those that aren't sure. That's open letter marketing. They have their own uh, Podio build out that talks to their OLM hub. It's really, uh, it's really great for like, if you're doing direct mail and other stuff, cause you can work in your Podio and, and stack stuff in his system. 
Mm-hmm. Um, they're still working some of the bugs out, but it's, it's pretty sweet. So, you know, I basically live in two places. I live in our inbox that we built for our text messaging and I live in my seller leads. And I, these are all the people I have on here that are all people that are connected to our account. So mm-hmm. leads come in, they come into seller leads and they get dropped into a bucket and they come in as new leads need to call. So here's new leads need to call. And then some of these, I'm getting a lot of scam calls lately. So like there's new leads need to call. So let's see if any of these are any decent calls. Mm-hmm. Um, seller. So yeah, here's a call right here. So address there, which I be fast on that. There's what the property looks like. Um, you know, this one, I sent it to my realtor. It was a cold call. Um, so I just sent it straight to my realtor. I didn't want to, it's a retail house. So I sent it to him, very good condition. Kitchen's been redone, bathrooms, blah, blah, blah. No asking price. So like to hear our offer. So it's a nice house, very good condition. So I sent it to my realtor. He's going to call him instead of saying, he's going to say, Hey, you know, you talked to my associate the other day about a cash offer. Um, you know, actually, I think I can get you way more money on the open market listing. I'd love to sell you some, send you some comps and I can try to get referral fees off of that. So, but then once you start listing all these things, there's all this information in here that you can tag it. And so everything's tagged to call rail. So once I come in here on a phone campaign, I can tag it to Mike's phone campaign. So then it goes, he can call in and out of that number. And then I actually just add or remove who it, who's in here. And so I'll go to Mike Petrello in here and I'll remove myself. So now it's his lead. So everything's tied to Mike Petrello. And then you have all these different things, you know, initial call called all these things. And so it will label them and um, over time, but then I can also click and call these people back right here. And once I do that down here, it will have all the different times I've called them. It'll come up with all the the phone numbers, all the recordings, all that stuff. And if I go to, um, let me see, let me go to one of my seller leads that I have talked to David. What is that? David Dunk. Let's go to David. So, we so just, is that your call, your, your call system is plugged into this. So you have yeah. dialers plugged into this. Yeah. Uh, no, our, our VAs just use a web form and they just automatically drop in. So you can do it with any CRM call rails plugged in, but then, so like David Duncan, this house we just bought the other day. So, um, so the lead came in, I called them back. I set the appointment. Um, so here's all the information here on the right side. But, um, so I added information my VAs listen to my phone calls because I don't want to make notes. My VAs actually listen to my phone calls and um, write the address. And then, you know, he makes all the notes in there. And then at that time, I put all the information in there, follow up. So the guy, you know, he said, hey, just heads up, you need to call this lead back. I told him I'd call him on Monday. And then it tracks all the times they've called. And I can go all the time. So you track who's working what in your system. So there's all the information in the system of how many times we've had conversations back and forth. And so it's freaking sweet because I can go in and I can track by leads, by jobs in here. So I can track by like, if you have multiple, two acquisitions guy, or it's you, or you have a realtor that you push stuff off, I can go right here and say, Hey, this is for Tri-Cities listings. He's got 12 leads. He needs to work. When was the last time he worked it? You know, this one's four days old. Hey, get in that system. But he only has to work in his home. Right. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty nice. You know, people overcomplicate it a lot. Um, but once you get your, you know, simple call rail or there's a, another smartphone you can use as well um, and get those integrated into your podio. And then you just, it's so simple once you figure it all out. Then once the leads coming in, you just work those leads and you set reminders and make notes in there. And, and then you have your leads that you, your, we call them ocean leads. Maybe they're not ready to sell right now, but they're ready to sell three, six months. So you just keep following up with them and have, you know, and, build them and make notes in there and everything's right there in the system. Not saying mine's yeah, the best way. What's that? No, it's streamlined. Like everything's in one place as opposed to, uh, I got to go to a Google doc and then I got to go to a CRM and then I have to go to a list uh, stacker and like, whatever. I mean, you still might need some of those tools, but at least getting information is all in one place. Yeah. And so, and the cool thing is once you, um, you know, when, a, when somebody calls me on one of my tracking numbers, it automatically pops up a seller lead. So they just go, I just go right into that new seller lead and I put all the information right there. And so yeah. then it's, you know, it's, 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 it's you can track your marketing campaigns. Okay. Was this cold call? Was this SMS? Was this direct mail postcard? Was this direct mail mailer? Which one's hitting better? Once you get into the business farther, you can really track those KPIs. Right now you just want to get mail out of the door, cold call people, talk to people on the phone and get your skills up and go get in some houses and talk to people. Um, so that's really, yeah, that's uh, good. That, so, so, okay. That, that's pretty much the biggest challenge. I mean, if I had to say any others, it would just be, um, 
right now, the list we've pulled, there have been days that we haven't gotten a single lead. Yeah, this is how it is. So I mean, like, not- and but I guess where we go with that is trying to diagnose is that is the list bad or is the caller not doing the right things? And then we'll listen to calls, but it's like, it's hard to pin, we're having trouble pinpointing that. You're not getting enough dials out. And so that's really, that's really the issue. So when we're calling for people, we're getting 3000 dials out a day. And so uh, some days are more, some days are less on the, on the lead flow, usually on the front end um, of the list. Cause we're pulling, li- having people pull for a three month contract, you need about 40 to 60,000 records usually. Um, and so on the front end of the, we, we dial through that list like 11 times. The machine will tell us that the dialer will tell us when the list is, is no good anymore, but it calls them. You're going to get more leads on the front because the first numbers are going to tend to be right more. Um, but then also we want to have good conversations. So we want to make sure we're running them through a six step process of making sure they actually want to talk to somebody. Um, you're going to get more leads up front, but you shouldn't have, we don't really have days and unless you're in like San, um, like maybe San Francisco or sometimes you might not have any leads, you know, but Midwest markets, you should have lead, You should be talking to people every day. I mean, every day, they're just not getting enough dials out. Um, mm-hmm. And you just in cold calling, you either go, there's two ways to cold call. You will either go highly niche where you're calling like driving for dollars, good driving for dollars, probates, divorces, evictions, and you're only targeting those and you're making single line calls with yourself or a US based person, or you're going really wide and you have a really wide net and you just have a big funnel that's funneling this down to talk to more people. There's no, if you're just calling, you know, a couple hundred people a day, it's just not going to work. Um, you know, you just can't scale because you have to, we're only closing like one out of 60 leads that come through on cold calling. And so you have to have 60 leads a lot. So, you know, you got to get enough data to get 60 leads. If you want one deal a month, you got to get at least 60 people to talk to you that month. If you want two deals, it's 120, whatever. Right. Um, and so then, but if you have a good realtor component, we're seeing about one out of 20 that if we pass off to a realtor is one out of you know 15 to 20 that they can wow. convert into a listing. And so then if you get a $22,000 referral fee, that pays for your whole month of marketing right there. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, much more than one month of marketing. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, well, if you're, you're paying us 1800 bucks to cold call, that one one listing pays for your whole freaking thing. For your whole month. Yeah, right there. Call. Yeah. All right. That's awesome, man. I mean, um, most of the guys using it, they're like, they're not saying how to, you know, if, they're, if they have a, like, they're not, they're part-time, they're half in, half out, like we talked about earlier. They're, they're the ones falling off. But if you're, these guys are all in, they're not asking us how do we down slow it. Sometimes they're saying, hey, we need to slow it down on the lead flow. But a lot of them that want to grow, they're saying we need to add more callers because it's freaking awesome. Yeah, I mean, we're going to give it a shot. So yeah, yeah 100%. And, so, and just know cold calling is a commodity business. There's a lot of guys out there. The difference between us and somebody else um, that maybe it might be a little bit less, we do what we just did before this call. We hop on a Zoom call. Myself personally hops on a Zoom call with you, with my other assistant, we take notes. We, we, you talk us through your business and we build, if we're a good fit for you, we'll tell you if you're not a good fit and you need to come back to us in six months, we'll help you with lists or we'll help you with podio stuff and things like that. But we tell you, this is probably what you should do. This is probably the route you should take. Um, whether it's one caller and a smaller list or two callers and this, and we help you and navigate. And I give you feedback on, this is where you should go. This is where your business is. I pull your list. I help you pull your list. So I'm thinking like an investor. How would I think if I'm Jonathan in this market? What, you know, if I need to get it a little bit bigger, what do I do? If I need to get a little bit smaller, what am I taking off? So you're getting more of that personalized touch. Damn, that's good. Because I think that's also where a lot of people like, they're in that middle ground. They don't want to pay 10 grand or whatever. I mean, again, nothing against education. I'm just talking about the people. They don't want to, they don't necessarily want to spend that much if they don't know that this person is going to be great for them or if they don't know if they're going to be doing it for that long. But then again, on the other side of it, there's like the no guidance route where people just buy a list and kind of start cold calling. And then like the middle ground, I don't think there's a lot of opportunity. So something like this, even if you're talking about jumping on the call with someone, giving them more of like guidance on, Hey, if you were going to do it with us or without us, I would go this way. I think it's a better option than if people can commit to spending two or 3000 a month, you know, 1800 and then maybe a little bit more on other yeah. stuff. Like why not? They're getting kind of the best of both. Yeah. And so the nice thing that we also did is Jay Scott, Scott gave us idea you know, those middle ground people, the starting out, they don't want to spend 10, $20,000 on coaching. They want to spend some money on marketing, but they don't really know where to go. So yeah. at first you'll get the 45 minute call with me. We do op- offer a thing where we'll do like a business in a box. You can do, um, we'll set you up with a, a full podio system. 
Uh, we'll set you up with uh, uh, like five hours worth of coaching from Tucker and I. We'll dive into your market. We'll find the best area to market to in your market. We'll find the best plan on how to market, build you out a six month marketing plan on how you should market it. We charge eight grand for that. So it's pretty cheap. Um, then you would just pay for the marketing stuff on top of it. You don't have gotcha. to, don't have to get the podio. You can get a simple podio to start. Um, you can just pay Tucker and I to dive into your market and do a, a deep dive into your market and like maybe a couple hours of coaching. Um, so you're not having to pay a full course, you know, but we like, you get a little bit more handholding on that. Um, and a little bit more guidance from guys, you know, Tucker has been coaching guys all over the country. So he knows how to make any market work. I know how to make marketing work. I know how to talk to sellers. So you can get, you, know, you can coach, I can help you coach you on how to talk to sellers and we can, we can help you figure out your marketing. And it's not that much money in the grand scheme of things. So if you have $10,000 to spend on marketing, right, you pay us, you know, three to five grand for a little bit of guidance, you know, five, three to five hours of guidance or whatever. Um, plus then you get some, then you have five grand for marketing, seven to five grand for marketing. You can use the cold calling and we can go that route. Um, but then you also have somebody that's talked you through, how do you talk to a cold se or seller on a cold call lead? Tucker sells a little super cheap uh, negotiating with sellers course for like 500 bucks. Um, and it's his sales guy just talking to sellers. That's all it is. It's different scenarios. How do I call back a cold call? How do I talk to an angry seller? How do I get a price out of somebody? How do I do this? Right. You know, people don't know how to do that shit. So um, we're trying to add value to people without, you know, I don't need the money. We got enough money from, from real estate. I do real estate for, still. That's my main business. This is more like a fun project to just grow something and see people successful. I mean, we got this guy that he uh, joined Tucker's program, um, like his DFA and stuff and started cold calling. He's brand new, had a million questions. We're like, dude, just go do it. Just go figure it out and help him a little bit. We built him a podio, you know, cause we felt bad for him. We wanted him to be successful. Two weeks in cold calling gets his first deal. is gonna make 80 grand on it. I mean, and this kid was asking us a million questions. I mean, he's freaking calling me like three times a day. And I'm like, dude, you guys gotta go fucking do it. You know, but he's awesome. And now he's got a deal and he's got another one under contract. And it's like, that's cool. That's more exciting to me almost than freaking buying a good flip, you know, because somebody's being right. successful. So, but I'm never going to stop doing real estate. That's the thing. I freaking love real estate. It's a freaking, it's a heroin. It's like heroin. <laughs> yeah, man. A lot better than a lot of, well, I mean, I'm not going to say drugs, but I'm saying a lot better than a lot of other ways to make money. And it can be a lot more systematized. So, 100%. Yeah. So, anyway. If you guys are listening and still here, uh, I'm going to work with Jonathan. He's going to come. He's going to start doing our cold calling, I think, and he'll let you know how it works. You have to get on the show and tell everybody, but we'll, we'll help you. We'll, we'll run you through the system and, and we'll make, we'll make a, a man out of you. <laughs> yeah. He's talking to all of you. He's not talking to me. <laughs> all right, guys. Good deal. Thanks for uh, jumping on. Hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, this is going to be a little bit of a different session a little bit more back and forth but also just more behind the curtain of what we were talking about before before we hit record this call was that mentality so if you're also out there listening and you're i don't want to say afraid but you're, you're feeling a little anxious about calling somebody and just having a pick your brain session it could be just like this and there are thousands of people that are on bigger pockets or facebook that are successful that will take your call or if you can find a way to bring them value, you just heard a conversation that I would have had if this podcast wasn't being recorded or if it was being recorded. So you can just use this as kind of the talk track. People want to talk about what they're doing. People want to yeah. give back and help people. You just heard Elliot talk about it. So anyway, I would guys, snoop, what, add to that. I would snoop on their Facebook. If you want to find somebody, snoop on their Facebook, see what hobbies they have. If you want to yeah. talk to them, send them, if they're, say they're a golfer, send them like buy the best golf ball, send them like a $150 package to their, you know, find their house or address, send them a $150 package worth of golf shit. Or, you know, if they got a bunch of kids, send a bunch of toys for their kids. I've done this to lawyers and stuff. I send toys and movie coupons for their kids. Dude, they're going to call you. They're going to talk to you. So if you don't feel like you don't have any value to add to people, you got $150, send it to them. Say, Hey, I'd love to pick your brain. Can, can we have a, a phone call? I'd really, you know, here's some stuff for your kids or whatever. I um, agree with that more. If you don't, if you're not creative, read Giftology. It's one of the best books oh, we've had. John, yeah, come yeah. talk to the group. It, it, if like that opened my eyes that if, if the person you're trying to get near has 20 Ferraris and you're like, what could I buy that person that would add any value to them? Buy them a book about Ferraris, the history of Ferraris. That is something that might cost 20 bucks, but it's something you know they're passionate about. Find it and then just tie it back to what you can afford. And it's more the, the thought that the effort that counts. Couldn't agree more, man. Fact. We're out. All right, Elliot. Great Later. session, man.